Well, hello and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2. Today we're going to be looking at this monitor. It's the Commodore Amiga or just Amiga branded 1080 monitor. So this was pretty much the monitor here in the US that was released and sold with the Amiga 1000. This was recently given to me, unknown condition. And uh, in this video, I want to just uh, take a look inside. Let's see what's going on with this thing. So getting a little closer on this, uh, condition-wise, it's in decent shape. There's a little bit of a scuff right there on the painted part of the plastic, revealing the lighter beige underneath. The door is installed and working correctly. The button here has a little bit of yellowing. There's a relatively big dent in the plastic right there. Maybe this thing's been dropped or bumped around quite a bit at least. On the back of the monitor, not much to report. It's uh, relatively good condition here. There's the date. It says November 1985. So as I mentioned, this was pretty early on and I pretty much was the monitor that was released with the Amiga 1000. Can also be used with Commodore 64 and also the IBM PC with CGA and the C128 because it has digital input, analog input as well all through this nine pin connector here plus the Chroma video, which is like S-Video type input on the back for the 64, the 128, or composite only for Apple IIs and whatever else. It's, uh, yeah, it's a very versatile monitor. It was the beginning of the famous 1084 line. This was just called the 1080, but basically is the same as all the later ones. So it is just a great monitor. Now, this particular monitor um, has stuff floating around inside. There was a bit of clunking noise right there. And if I pick it up and turn it around, there's stuff floating around inside of there. And I can tell you that things floating around inside a monitor might be not a problem, but it also might be a big problem. So as Dave Jones would say, before you turn it on, take it apart. And yes, my impersonation of the Australian accent is crap. Also on these monitors, like starting with the 1080 and all the ones that look just like this, uh, 1084s and stuff like that, there's this metal plate on the bottom, which I think you have to take off before you can take the monitor apart. I am not sure what this thing does. I think it's for shielding. The weird thing is, is it covers up almost all of the vent holes on the bottom. There's a little bit exposed right here. So any kind of ventilation that would be available to this monitor through the bottom would not happen with this plate install. There it goes. <laughs> Look at that. It's a seriously heavy piece of metal here. And actually now looking at the bottom here, like this part of the monitor is what is on the front part and this all comes off. So you could probably leave that plate uh, installed when you pull the monitor cover off, but I'm not totally sure. This should lift off at this point. Of course, it goes without saying when you're opening a monitor, please don't do it unless you know what you're doing. There are dangerous voltages in here, especially if it's connected to mains while you're working on it. So I'll always unplug that, but there are high voltages in the CRT picture tube as well that can give you a nasty jolt. Uh, there are speakers on this back cover that are connected and there's a little connector right on this side. Uh, the other models or later models are stereo and there's two speakers. There's one speaker there and there's a capability of having another speaker over there. It's funny, the plastic molding was set up even in 1985 to have a stereo speaker. Why it was only installed as mono, I have no idea. You can see some black soot on the top there. So this monitor was obviously well used, whoever was the Amiga owner who had this thing. Okay, what exactly is floating around in here? Well, well, there's something right there. Okay, um, I think this was something to do with stabilizing. Maybe it was for stabilizing the flyback right here. And when you look at the underside of the board, right off the bat, I noticed that there's a little bit of a problem right here. PCB is actually cracked. Let me turn this monitor this way. There's a big crack in the CRT uh, PCB. I mean, it goes all the way down there, right through traces. So no wonder why this monitor um, didn't work at some point. And yeah, it's the flyback transformer that's sort of flopping around on there. See that right there? See the crack goes through here and all down there. Looking at this plastic here, it looks like maybe that one into the flyback and this might have like connected to the back of the monitor or the plastic there and given a little stabilization to the flyback there. And I'm gonna say that's exactly what that was right there. This was probably like that. And it actually connected to the top of the flyback and that gave the stability. 
So this monitor was definitely dropped or impacted in some way that snapped that off of that and then broke the flyback right off the PCB. So I'm taking a look here and the damage is relatively extensive. So there's a trace that comes up here, goes to there and there, and it's broken right through it. There's a trace that comes up the PCB here and goes to that leg on the flyback, and that is broken. Not to mention it goes over here to there, and it looks like there might be a break right there as well. Then this pin seven here goes over to there and it goes over something over here and it's broken there and there. This trace here is broken right there. There's like a capacitor on the other side of this that's probably okay. There's a trace from this diode here that goes across the crack and then off the crack again. And there's a break right there. And there's a break right here. Yeah, there's a lot of breaks. And then the crack also goes over here. Might have broken this trace right there. And uh, didn't, that, that one's not broken. And this is okay. So yeah, this thing suffered some serious trauma. Now, because the flyback is mostly disconnected now, if uh, someone were to plug this monitor into power, try to turn it on, you're pretty much not gonna get anything. The power supply on the board, which um, I think is, uh, well, I don't know where it is. It's over here probably. That's gonna try to, you know, send B plus and whatnot into the flyback. And uh, of course there's the horizontal drive and all sorts of other things that are going on in the flyback. All the various voltages of the monitor except for B plus are derived from the flyback itself. So it not working is gonna cause pretty much all the various functions of the monitor not to work at all. Not to mention you're not gonna get high voltage, so there won't be any image. <laughs> I know there's gonna be other problems like that. Now, I could try to, as an experiment, grab some wire and we should just start bodging across these traces here. Let's see if we can get this monitor working again. I mean, I don't know. I don't really trust this because once the PCB cracks like this, it could uh, crack a lot worse, but it might be a fun experiment to try to get this working. So I think I'm gonna grab some wire like this and I'm just gonna start connecting these up again with this. Luckily, all the connections in this part of the monitor are very chunky, so it should be pretty easy to solder onto, try to repair. So if you're doing this kind of repair or you have a monitor that has uh, this type of issue, all you gotta do is just kind of be, uh, what is it, methodological or take a, a methodological approach or be methodical. That's what I'm trying to say. And you just kind of go through and check, check, check. You know, this one here, there's a crack right next to it. So because of that, I might as well try to bridge it. And you just have to look at the cracks and anticipate, oops, that it's possible. Ugh, this wire is a little bit too thick for what I'm trying to do here. Anyways, as I was saying, you just have to look where the cracks are and try to anticipate where a new crack might form. Uh, maybe I should, once this is done, apply some like JB Weld or, or hot glue or some kind of epoxy or something to this. Uh, this wire I'm using, it's pretty thick and transfers a lot of heat. So as you're uh, connecting it up, it's kind of burning your fingers a little bit. Pay attention if there's little cuts in the board, like right there, that's a, an isolation gap between those pins there and whatever this is. So just make sure you don't uh, get the wire you're connecting up very close. Don't get like the wire from that pin over to these pins. That could cause a little bit of a, an issue if it jumps across. Okay, so let's see, we have this trace is hooked up to there. There's a crack there. This one uh, pin of the flyback goes over to there and there's a crack there. And that one there is going up to there, but I'm gonna also have to run a wire somewhere over here because this uh, comes off of that pin and goes back down and there's a, there's a crack right there. Uh, let's see, that one needs to be bodged over there. This pin here also goes to there. And pin seven here has to go to there. So let me fix that. Then I'll fix these further away traces next. I just dropped a wire down in here. Oh, and it fell all the way down. Of course it did. All right, so, okay, pin six goes to that resistor. The crack is right there, so it's under the resistor. And pin four, the crack is just through here. So what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna jump over that in case the crack gets worse. 
All right, for this broken trace, I am actually just gonna wrap a little piece of an off cut around it, because uh, it goes between three pins that are very close to each other, and the crack is just kind of in that area. So I'm gonna bridge these with this metal piece here instead. It's a little bit of extra length here. I'll just cut that off. There we go. Okay, so that one is connected. This is connected through the crack there to that. There's a crack right there, so that is also connected through. All right, this uh, transistor here, which is probably the horizontal flyback or horizontal drive, uh, that's probably like the collector or the emitter here, uh, goes up to here on the flyback to these two pins, or actually just that pin. I don't know, this is something else. So I have that old bodge, the crack kind of goes through there. So it's still connected up to the flyback by going to that pin, and then that's jumped to there, and that jumps over there, which connects via capacitor to that. So that looks good. There is a crack that's right there, hasn't made its way through this trace yet, so I'm gonna jump this right here, just in case it does in the future. All right, now just double checking here. How about this? This, uh, this is broken right here, so I need to go from that to something over in this ground plane. Okay, so this trace is jumped by this wire. This trace, well, I probably should jump it. it hasn't been jumped yet. But this one is jumped by that wire. Let me just do this uh, extra pin right there. Ooh, that's hot. That is really hot. All righty, let's double check. Okay, so that's jumped even though it doesn't need to be. This was jumped to there even though it doesn't need to be. This pin goes to there because there's a crack right there. This crack is there, so that goes to there. That one's not connected. This one doesn't have a crack because the crack is over here goes under the resistor, that pin goes to there because the crack is right there. This pin here of the resistor needs to be fixed because there it goes somewhere else. And there is a crack right there that goes on this trace, which goes over there somewhere. Uh, this is jumped to there because there's a crack right there. There's also a crack right there. And the trace above, which looks like goes between that diode and something over there, goes through a crack as well and the crack makes its way to right there on the flyback. So it shouldn't affect these other parts up here. Then this pin here has a crack that goes through there and that is jumped over. And then this is like, uh, actually that's not ground. That has a crack right through it, goes to this side, that is jumped there, so that looks good. This stuff is fine and yeah, that's it. So I just need to fix this trace, this trace, and this trace, so three more traces. And unfortunately these traces sort of do snake all around the board here, so Gonna have to take a moment here to figure that out. So I'm gonna mark it with blue first off to kind of help me find it. So that, that dot there goes around here. It's the bottom of these traces under the paint over here, down there, here. I think it goes to right here. Looks like a width coil or something. So I'm gonna put a, a blue dot there. Now what I can do to help me just to double check that that is really connected over here on the other side of the crack is I'm just gonna dig under the solder mask right there and just double check there's continuity. So multimeter on continuity mode, let's double check. Yep. All right, I said it was to right there. And let's just dig in. There it is. Yes, okay, good. That confirms. And it's definitely broken, but if I go right on the crack, I can get that, that continuity there. So I'm going to take a shortcut. I'm just going to go from up there on this side of the resistor right down onto there. Now, I used relatively thick wire for all of this stuff because these traces are thick, thick, but these traces are very thin. So I really could use much thinner wire, but I'll just use this because I have it. I have it handy. All right, that looks really ugly, but let's see if that is indeed connected now to here, and it is. Let's make sure I didn't short these other things nearby. Nope, it's all fine. All right, the next thing is this trace here. There's the break right there. It's one up from the trace that we just did. So let's follow this again. Looks like it goes right here, right next to that one. Let's double check. Yep. All right, decided to change up the thinner wire. That red stuff is just a pain. And you know what, while I'm at it, I'm gonna take this red wire off and put the white one in place of it. 
Because I just don't like how when you solder, try to solder onto fine points, the thing spreads out. It's just a pain in the butt. So that one goes right here. So they go right next to each other so they can be similar length. Okay, I'm just going to double check the second wire here. So I think it goes right there to this break right here. Yeah, it does. Okay. And uh, that break, that definitely, yeah, that goes there. Okay. Okay, so all that's left is this trace right here. It goes from this diode to something. Oh, it goes right to there. Okay, so all I need to worry about is from there to there. So that just has to go, it goes around this corner up to that right there. Let's just double check that. So here to there, yep. And from there to here should be broken right now. Yeah, it is because there's no wire. So let's just pop the wire in place. I think this is the last uh, thing to fix. Now let's be honest, you know, this is a, uh, I wouldn't say this is a long-term fix. I mean, this is not gonna be durable. If this thing gets banged around, you know, more things might crack, whatever, stuff like that. But, you know, in the short term, this can make a working monitor, theoretically. It's possible that things blew up when this was uh, tested by someone else. Ow, 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 ow. Ooh, that's hot. Okay, let's try that again, but with the tweezers, so I don't burn my fingers. All right, well, I think it's time for testing. And what we can do is I'll test this monitor and if it works, then I'll get some hot glue and I'll just sort of route these wires around things and, and glue them down a little bit. Maybe put a little bit of tape on it, who knows, stuff like that. When you have the monitor sitting like this, the PCB sort of bends quite a bit. So I'm just gonna shove a little piece of paper underneath there just to lift it up a little bit at least. It's not still bending, but at least it's a little bit of the strain is removed. Okay, so that is connected. The CRT doesn't look broken. Everything else appears to be connected properly. I don't see anything out of the ordinary, just all that stuff that we fixed. All right, the monitor is plugged into the wall, but I have it plugged into this big, ugly power strip here, and it's off right now. So I'm gonna turn on the front power switch on the monitor, make sure it's actually on. Okay, I think it's on. And now I'm gonna turn this on and we're gonna see if this blows or if it goes. Here we go. Nothing. So I wouldn't be surprised if the fuse blew on this monitor. So let's go find that fuse and check it out. Could also have more damage on the PCB than I initially saw. It was certainly anticlimactic there. So a fuse, three amp. Yeah, it's not blown. Interesting, okay, power switch. Uh, this is the power switch right here. So if I push it on. We have continuity. So that means the mains input, which comes in right here, should be there. And when I turn off the switch, it's not there. Okay, here's the bridge rectifier right here. Let's just check that. Put this on diode check. 0 0.49, 0 0.49, 0 0.49, and what about this one? Oops, that was touching two pins there. 0 0.48, no, 0 0.49, 0 0.49 as well. Okay, so those diodes are working. That means um, this must be the large filter cap right here. We're probably going to see some high voltage on there with the monitor plugged in and turned on. So I'm going to do that with it sitting just like this. First of all, let's just make sure it's off. Okay, it is off. Make sure this is off, that is indeed off. Okay, there we go. I'm just gonna check for cracks or anything. Yeah, I don't see any other cracks. It's just over there. All right, uh, let's put this on volts and let's make sure that this is on and here we go. Yep, definitely getting nothing. How about on this uh, main filter cap right here? Oh yeah, 163 volts. So that is working. Let's see how quickly that discharge discharges. 14 volts already, so that discharge is pretty quick. So why do we have no activity on the monitor? Not even the power LED comes on. Maybe more went wrong with this thing 
when it um, had this drop, like there's, you know, someone tried to power it up and it kind of blew things up a little bit. Let's check out this uh, large switching transistor here. Just checking to see if it's shorted. So that's fine, not shorted. And yeah, we're getting diode drop across, uh, uh, it says collector, base, and emitter. So yeah, we're getting diode drop between emitter and collector, 0.45, and we're getting the same thing between the base and the collector. Now, when you look across the base and the emitter, it looks like it's a short, but I think that's because there's a, a drive transformer and the drive transformer can give you a little bit of a trick. So why isn't this thing turning on? Uh, is it still on? Yes, it is. Turn that off for safety. <laughs> I just noticed there's another fuse right here. That could be blown. Let's just check that one for continuity. Now, I'm pretty sure if I look around, I'll probably find some schematics for this thing. I haven't even looked yet. It probably exists. Let's just put this to continuity mode. Here we go. Oh, that fuse is good as well. Interesting, very, very interesting. I think I might go to the schematics now just to help me out a little bit. No point to reverse engineer stuff if you don't have to. All right, looking at the schematics, I can see that there's a switch mode power supply right here and this fuse that I checked, the second fuse I found, 1.2 amps. This is actually 115 volts DC fuse uh, it's the B+, plus. it's generated by the power supply, which is like a switch mode power supply. Yes, this is an isolated design. It's not uh, like the older linear dropper things with the big resistors. Anyhow, I need to check that 115 volts is on this fuse uh, to the chassis ground, and there just happens to be a little bit of a ground lead right there for clipping onto. It's labeled ground. Uh, now the power LED, which was not turning on, is generated by stuff over on this part of the power supply. So if there's no voltage coming from the switch mode power supply, then yeah, none of this electronics is even going to work. All right, so let's plug in the mains connector here. Now that is off down there. Okay, the monitor switch is on. Now I'll turn on that. Nothing coming out of the monitor at all. There we go. We have 116 volts. So we are getting B plus. It very interesting. Let's see how quickly that goes away. It's dropping, dropping, dropping down to nine, seven, two, one volts. And let's check that big filter cap, which is right here. And uh, yeah, we're at eight volts now. So there's a bleeder resistor obviously on there. All right, so this B plus does make its way over to the flyback and looking at the schematics, which I know you can't see, uh, appears to go to pin two on here. So pin two is this one with this squiggly wire. So let's check to see if that has B plus. Is this thing still on? Yes, it is. So that's pin three, pin two right here. Yep, 116 volts on the flyback and I fixed that trace. All right, now looking at the power LED on this monitor, it appears the power LED comes off of this rail here, which appears to be generated by the flyback. So I think that implies that like if the flyback's not running, meaning that the um, horizontal drive is not happening, then we are not gonna get like the power LED or, or most of the other monitor for that, or most of the rest of the electronics powered up for that matter. I think this calls for a little oscilloscope action. So we're gonna use the battery powered oscilloscope here to look for horizontal drive. That is going into the uh, flyback, which we know is going to be coming right off here. Well, we're going to look at the base first. For testing, I'm going to use this, which I bought, and it is the T3100, 120 megahertz. Okay, come on. There we go. 100X probe. So with this, a little more safety for this little oscilloscope here. And it has a probe compensation thing on here. I haven't used this before. This will be the first time, actually. So we just plug that in. I just need to set this to channel, uh, let's see, channel one, channel two, channel one on 10X probe. No, we're gonna set it to 100X probe. All right, let's turn this on. Now I'm wondering if it's this collector that's the problem. So we're getting voltage there. So I'm at 50 volts per digit, so that's like 120. That's B plus. What about here on the collector though? Aha, nothing. So you know what, I, I assumed that that, oh, this is, this is good everyone, this is good. Okay, so I know you can't really see, I don't think you could see what just happened, but basically 
over here when I was fixing all these traces, I was under the assumption that the collector here on the transistor would still be getting a signal through this wire, but I just noticed there's an extra crack right there. So there was no voltage on the collector, which means that the monitor is not gonna run. <laughs> Let's let me bodge that in, and then we'll see if that fixes it. We're gonna use the red wire though, because we need that thick, thick trace here. There's definitely a lot of current that goes through there. All right, so it goes from there. So that's the horizontal drive transistor. I think it's uh, 404 and the collector there. There's a trace that goes up here and it goes to there and it goes to there. Well, there's a crack there and I, I was assuming that the collector was still connected to there. I didn't actually check it because the trace looks like it's sort of cracked only halfway and shouldn't make it there, but it wasn't. So I'm just gonna connect that up to there as well. So we get all three wires and maybe that'll make this monitor work. All right, well, um, let's see. I'm just gonna turn this on. Let's move things away a little bit. Will it blow or will it go? Here we go again with that. So let's turn this on. The switch is off there. Here we go. Whoa, started. It is running, everyone. Let's hook the ground up and let's connect up to the base here on the transistor. All right, so there's the base drive. It says it's running at 19 kilohertz, a bit too fast. I don't know if I really trust uh, that frequency counter. Let's turn off the monitor. Definitely sounds like it's working, like the way the high voltage sounds and everything. All right, so let's flip the monitor back down so we can take a look at the picture uh, tube, see what it's doing. Okay, let's turn it on. Sounds like it's working normally. I gotta get the, I gotta power up the, uh, test pattern generator, because it is not connected right now. We're getting a little something something. Let me check the high voltage on this thing. All right, I'm getting 24 kilovolts on this thing, which is, sounds, seems a little high. I don't know. I've got a little flasher when I turned it off. Let's see if this says anything about it here. X-ray, okay, beam must not exceed 27.5 kilovolts under any operating condition. And it says normal second anode voltage is 26.5 kilovolts at zero beam current. Okay, well, this is not the most accurate tool, but um, there's like an X-ray protection circuit in these monitors. So if the beam current goes too high, and, and by the way, I was, I was reading right here, the sticker usually tells you what you need to know. Um, if the beam current or if the high voltage goes too high, it will actually shut down the monitor because there's a risk of generating X-rays or whatever uh, through the front of the CRT, which you don't want. You really don't want that. So. Alrighty, the Tektronix test pattern generator is powered up. And this cable here has the video signal we are looking for. We'll connect this up. Which is the video signal? The red input? Hmm. I must refer to the back of the monitor. Chroma is the bottom. Okay, so it's yellow. Okay, there it is. Yellow input. Let's position the camera. There we go. Turn this on. Composite is there. Oh, look. Freaking look at that. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Let me reposition this. All right, well, we're getting a really good image, but there's a problem with the purity here. Let's change this to red. That's an issue. And it could be that this monitor needs a good degaussing. That is quite possible. But it also could be that being dropped has damaged the shadow mask inside the CRT. From a picture quality standpoint, well, besides this messed up color in the corner, it's not bad. It really is not bad. Well, I'm gonna kill the power on this and I'm gonna turn it so I can look straight on and I'm going to get the degaussing coil and we will try to degauss it. It's possible that the built-in degaussing coil that's um, on the board here, and there's like a metal coil around the, the picture tube here, that may not be working because it uses like a thermistor usually or a something like that, like a little thing that gets really, really hot. And that can result in it getting burned out and it just is inoperative at that point. All right, let's turn this back on. There we go. Let's bring up the color field. Looks just as bad. There's actually this ripple going on here, which is kind of a common problem with these. I have another one of these that's doing the exact same thing and I have to figure out which capacitor, that would be a bad capacitor that's in this monitor causing that problem. That, yeah, it's gotta be caused by the vertical blanking or the horizontal blanking. So the scan line goes to here, then it blanks, and then it jumps back to this side and it starts going again. Will that on and off 
that 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 sharp on and off that's happening as it blanks and unblanks, I think causes a little bit of ripple here because there's a bit of an issue with a power supply cap somewhere in the monitor. So if you are watching this and you have an idea of which cap that probably is, uh, let me know. So this is a manual degaussing coil that a lovely viewer sent in. I'll plug this in the wall right there. And now if I push the button, there's a button right there on it. If I push the button, see it degausses the monitor. So we can kind of go around the corner here. Is that improved at all? Maybe. So you just kind of try to get the color out of there. You know what, that, that seems to have improved it a little bit. So that would imply that there is definitely a degaussing issue uh, with the coil that, or the thermistor that's on this monitor. Well, I'd say that's definitely improved a little bit. So you don't want to run this thing too long because it's running line voltage through a coil that's in here. So just keep that in mind. It probably has a thermal cutoff or something. Let's see what it says here. Listed, 830M, picture tube degausser. Uh, normal degaussing time, approximately 10 seconds. Maximum time, one second on. Clearly I was doing 10 seconds worth of degaussing and it wasn't really doing the trick for this thing. So better and better, but not perfect. All right, I was just uh, putting some hot glue on these wires here since this thing is working and um, it kind of seems to strengthen that whole thing up a little bit. So yeah, the hot glue is on there. Then I started looking for caps that might be causing that ripple that I was uh, talking about before. And right here on the neck board, the B plus comes onto the neck board. So the neck board, of course, is driving the, the, uh, the RGB electron beams, right? And 130 volts right here comes up. And it, these are all the drive transistor pairs that drive the uh, emitters. And there is a cap right here, 4.7 microfarad, 160 volts. Well, it was on the board, it was right here, and I removed it to check it. Now, you can't really check uh, the, the local cap, if it was good or not, because uh, the caps on the main board are all in parallel and they're all gonna kind of like show up. And I did quickly test it just with the ESR meter. And even though it's 4.7 microfarad on the schematics, this was showing up as like 30 microfarad or 40 or something like that because of all the other caps. So I removed it and I was about to test it and I dropped it on the floor. It didn't look like it was damaged before I did test it, like there wasn't any corrosion or anything, but I dropped it on the floor and it flew under something and I can't find it. <laughs> so I have found another cap here. I went into my Bino parts. This one is a G Luxon 33 microfarad at 200 volts. It does test okay in the ESR meter. It's a lot more than the 4.7, but I'm just gonna pop it in there and let's see if that makes any change whatsoever for that kind of ripple effect. I don't know if that cap is causing that, but I am. I have a suspect, or I suspect that it might be that one. And incidentally, on the neck board though, there are two caps, two electrolytics, just two. This one, that's the B plus, and there's one other one that does something else, and it might be the other one. The other one is close to some other components, like heat generating things. This one was at the bottom, and while it was sort of close-ish to things that get hot, not really. So that one's not baked. I, you always want to suspect caps that are baked. Anyhow, I'm going to reinstall this way too big cap in here. <laughs> and let's see if that makes any difference whatsoever. Just taking a look at the other electrolytic right there, 16 volts, 100 microfarad. What exactly is that used for? Let me see if I can find it on the schematics here. There it is. No, that's not it. It's right here. It's between ground. I'm sure it's impossible to see this. Sorry about this being such a crappy video, but it's just sort of rough troubleshooting on my point, on my part. This has to do with the bias control uh, on all three of them. Okay, so that easily could be it. And that's a super common value. So if this doesn't, if that other cap I changed didn't make any difference at all, I am definitely gonna change that cap. It is right near, um, it's right there. Oh, you really can't see it. Um, it's right there, which there's a bunch of resistors and things around it. So kind of screams that that could be the problem. Okay, let's turn on the power here. Didn't make any horrible noises, it's still working. Let's see, yeah, that didn't change anything there. Um, okay, I'm just gonna kill the power here on the power strip, that is. 
Let me swap out that 100 uh, microfarad cap since that's a very easy one, and a very common value. And I picked up a new tool that Jordan Peer recommended using. Well, he uses them, it's a hemostat, and it's a way to easily grab capacitors when they're like out of the way and you can't really get to them because that one's sort of buried in there. So let me just try to remove this and it will be my first use of the hemostat. Of course, the soldering iron is all tied up around everything else. Let's heat that up. Oh yeah, what a great tool that is. Oh yeah, that rocks. That was really good. Okay, so I'm not gonna drop it this time. All right, so let's test this on the ESR meter. ESR, it's only 0 0.4, 0 0.5 ohms, and we're getting uh, about 85 microfarads at one kilohertz right now. Here's a brand new Nichicon, same value. And um, wow, what a difference in size. 100 microfarad, 16 volts, and 16 volts, 100 microfarad. All right, time marches on, right? All right, so let's put the Nichicon in. Well, this one even seems worse. Um, one kilohertz, we're getting 85 microfarad at 1.5 ohms. So this one certainly does not seem like it's in bad shape. What brand is this anyways? Oh, it's a uh, Nippon Chemicon, looks like. Yeah, so 85 and one, one ohm. <laughs> All right, well, anyways, I am just still gonna change this out just because I suspect that this is a problem. But I kind of half suspect that this is not gonna do anything. And this is a, a case of changing a cap that didn't need a cap being changed. And that's kind of my motto normally with this stuff. Like this monitor's from 85, right? And I'm not really trying to recap it at all because I don't believe that the caps that are on this thing are actually bad at all. But I do think that there is an issue with this monitor and besides the color purity problem. So, uh, I don't know. All righty, let's see how this looks now. Uh, power it up here. Oh, well, um, that made it a lot worse. We have lost the blue drive entirely. Interesting, how could one cap what? Okay, hmm. I am just checking my work. So that's the cap I just changed and I didn't damage anything. Nothing is shorted there. And the other cap is way down here and that is fine as well. So I almost feel like this problem is completely unrelated. I mean, it makes sense since I just touched this board that the problem is on here that there's no more blue drive, but... Like I said, I wasn't touching anything in that area. This cap definitely affects everything. It's nothing to do just with blue. All right, the monitor is powered up again and I have a, a mirror here. So I can see what's happening on the screen. Um, interesting. Now there's no picture at all. Okay, what did I do? What happened here? So right now, 100%, there is high voltage. I'm just putting on some gloves. There is high voltage on this monitor right now. I can hear it. Let's grab this oscilloscope here. I got a plug into ground, which here's a ground right there. All right, I'm just checking things out. 132 volts on that cap right there. How about the one I just changed out? Uh, looks like 14 volts on that one. That's kind of high considering that's only a 16 volt cap. Let's see, R902, where's R902? There's R902. So this is, that is the picture going to the, the CRT. Not really seeing anything. Not really seeing an image that is, just sort of a solid line. Which kind of would imply that there's just no video signal on this at all. I should be seeing like a stepped um, video signal on the scope here. Let's look at where the connections are onto this board. So there's a connector here, 59, is it this one? This one down here, pin 62. That's what I'm looking for right now, pin 62. Where is that? 
not there, and it doesn't seem to be down here. This is uh, 64 to 73. No, it's got to be that connector. Video signal must be coming in right here on this one. Yeah, it's interesting. The schematics don't really match the numbering that's on here. Yeah, there definitely is no video signal even coming into the neck board. So I think the problem exists somewhere else on this thing. Yeah, as I flip the switch on the front, I see a little bit of kind of a, a staticky, not static, but you know, a little bit of something happening on the CRT. And it's white. So that that implies that the problem that's happening right now is actually somewhere else on this thing. It's like on this um, this lower board. You bend it and move it around a little bit. Nope. Does this thing, this sideboard processes the video, I think. Let's bump on it a little bit. Nope, that's not causing anything. Okay, so I was starting to give a look over what might be wrong on the monitor and can you see this down here? There's a connector. Gosh, you probably can't see it. There is a connector that is not connected down there. This board right here is the video processing board and uh, definitely <laughs> a connector that was disconnected would cause an issue. I'm moving the connector right there with my finger. Let's try to reconnect that. The monitor is off right now. While I'm at it, I'm gonna connect these other connectors as well. Everything else is actually in good shape. Okay, let's flip this around, see if that made any difference whatsoever. All right, here we go. Power it up again. At least the power switch works properly. Just eating a little cheese. Look at that, we have a video picture again. <laughs> now, uh, Ripple's not changed at all. So it's nice that the picture's back and it actually looks great. The color's good if it weren't for the discoloration in the corners. Vibrant picture as well. And yeah, Ripple, not change whatsoever. So clearly that problem exists somewhere else on this monitor. I need to look around the main board for places where there's uh, capacitors next to like heat sinks and things that are gonna bake them. Maybe I just need to let this run for a while and uh, see if that improves at all. I'm gonna go have some dinner and I'll just let the monitor run with the color bars here and we'll see how it is when I come back. All right, it's been about an hour, actually. I was upstairs, I just left this thing running. <laughs> it still works. That's a good sign. Uh, there's, of course, still the ripple here. I did not fix that. All right, we'll check it out. It's actually looking pretty good right now. There it is, the red field. It's pretty even. It's not great. It's not great by any means, but it's not terrible either. Green looks pretty good. And blue, eh, okay, not great. But the thing is, that looks a lot better than it did initially. Now, what was it you ask? Well, I had to do the, I, I followed the service manual, which I have up on the screen right there. Basically, if you look up the section about color purity, it tells you to remove the little wedges. Let me turn the screen around. So it tells you to remove these little wedges right here, which are currently taped into position. You gotta remove these, then you have to loosen the yoke uh, which is a tie down is right there. And then you have to slide it all the way forward. Once you do that, you turn these, um, the purity adjustment magnets, which are the two on this monitor that are closest to the front of the screen. You turn those until the green um, display you have on the screen from the pattern generator has the most even amount of distortion around the four corners. So a little fiddling around. Then you slide this back to adjust the beam landing so that the image looks uniform and solid. Now, it took me quite a lot of fiddling back and forth, back and forth to get it to look like it does now, which is decent. But then the next problem you have is the convergence looks all weird because those, um, the little wedges that are in there um, position the yoke up, down, left, right. Now that was done at the factory, you know, by a technician who knew what they were doing and, and adjusting this thing to get it as good as possible. I tried my best to get this looking good. So you bring up the convergence pattern which is, we turn this around, is this one. You turn, you turn this one on and you're trying to get like the lines looking white uniformly across the entire picture. Now, as you shove the wedges into the yoke more, it sort of moves it up, down, left, right. You do all of that to try to get it looking as good as possible. It's not great. There's still some misconvergence there. 
and there's some down here as well. And I mean, it's there's a million adjustments with color CRTs. It's really an art, and I am a complete novice, and I really I don't really know what I'm doing. Now the question is, I have to ask, is why did this get out of adjustment in the first place? Like, did the drop? I mean, those those wedges were glued in. Everything was really tightly attached, like the yoke was not moving on its own. So I don't really know how it got out of adjustment. I'm assuming CRT age and I guess the shock of being dropped, because clearly this thing was dropped or banged enough that the flyback came loose. So yeah, I mean, it certainly looks better now. I would not say it's as good as a factory calibrated one because I'm just not, the good, not that good at it. But for using on something that's not super high res, like a 64, Commodore 64, it'd be totally, totally fine. The thing about color CRTs like this is you can fiddle with the convergence and the beam landing and all of that stuff forever. I mean, if you're skilled and you know what you're doing, it's probably you can make quick work of it, but someone like me, who doesn't know what they're doing? It is, it's not easy, it's really slow going. But I am somewhat pleased with myself that I think I've done a decent enough job on the CRT. So, you know what, I'm gonna put it back together and let's look at some video on it. All right, there's the monitor all back together and um, I actually been playing some Doom on it and I was watching some videos and obviously uh, this is one of my videos because no copyright. Well, I mean, I own the copyright to this so I won't have any trouble playing it. But yeah, it's working pretty well right at this point. So really, uh, the thing that went wrong with this thing is it was dropped and this thing broke off the top of the flyback transformer. It was connected right there. And this is what held that flyback transformer against the back of the case so that it didn't stress the PCB. It caused that crack. I had to reconnect it with all those bodge wires. And then of course that connector came free. And then we had color purity issues, which required me to move the yoke around and kind of reset up the monitor with color purity, which is always a bit of a pain because there's, it's just endlessly fiddly, but it's nice because it's working and, uh, yeah, I guess this thing was saved from the landfill or, you know, the e-waste, so to speak. I wouldn't have actually sent this thing to e-waste if I couldn't have made it work, like if it had a catastrophic problem, because there are plenty of good parts on this monitor that can be used to fix other monitors, like the door and the power switch and, you know, potentially the CRT and other things like that. But in the end, uh, this works to live another day, which is kind of cool. So I know this video was a little disjointed, I apologize for that. I just pointed the camera at this thing and I started recording. So hopefully some of it made sense and some of it's kind of useful for people who potentially have a similar problem with a monitor that they need to repair. Don't be afraid of cracked PCBs. I don't know how long this thing will work and not to mention, not really sure how, how strong it'll be if it gets banged around again, it could easily just snap that whole PCB entirely. But hopefully those bodge wires I did and I put a little hot glue should keep it all together. So comments down below, subscribe if you haven't already, thumbs up if you liked it, thumbs down, you know, all the usual stuff. And that is going to be that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye.